Thanks, Andrew. I'm super excited about that block party. You know, as a church, we exist for those who are not here right now. I mean, that's one of our primary purposes is to reach our community, and this is just one of those ways we can bless our neighbors, reach out, and build a bridge through which we could eventually share the gospel with some new people. Amen? So be praying for that, standing with us for that. Well, one thing that I absolutely love about this area is the mountains, and Every time I look at the mountains, I feel like the mountains are calling. They're calling me to go and explore, to experience that peace and the beauty and the quietness, the solitude, the adventure. And there's always that element of danger, too, that's included in the mountains. But it was several years ago that I took our 12-year-old son, Levi, on a day hike. That's how I would describe it. It was late spring, and the hike of my choice was Snow Lake up at the top of Snoqualmie Pass, which is one you can do in the late spring. The avalanche danger has passed, and so uh, it's a snow hike up to an alpine lake. It's somewhat strenuous, but nothing too technical or difficult. So we went to the Alpental parking lot, parked the car, and began to make our way up the trail, which quickly turned to snow, as we expected. And as you're hiking along this boot-worn path through the snow, you can easily identify that trail. Come across at least one avalanche chute where the, there is some debris and, of course, uh, some fresh snow that's come across the trail. Nothing really to worry about. This is a low avalanche part time in the year. But as we're proceeding along, just making our way, we were really by ourselves. It was a midweek day, not a lot of people up there. I don't remember seeing anyone else up there on this trail that day. And so as we're going along, I tell our son Levi some really wise advice about hiking and climbing. I said, Levi, if you ever feel like you're off path and you've gone the wrong way, you probably have. It's probably a good time at that moment to turn around and go back to where you know the path is. Don't keep going that direction. This is something I've learned through experience, trial and error, over and over again. So I share it with him, that point of wisdom. And as we continue along, I notice that our path gets uh, less boot-worn, becomes harder to see. There's a little fresh snow. There's not a trail trail, because we're not on the dirt, we're on the snow, so it's harder to identify your trail. And, and we start, it's getting steeper, and as it's getting steeper, the, the surface gets firmer, it turns more icy rather than snowy. And I notice, you know, at the end of this basin, there's peaks all around. You're kind of at the end of a bowl. And I knew that Snow Lake was up over one of those ridges. I th the ridge on the right, Whichever way you're facing, it's the one on the right. I don't know. So I know it's up over one of these ridges. And so as we're pressing up this trail, I see this waterfall cascading down the mountain in front of us. And it goes literally under the glacier. You can see way down below us, there's a, a pond where uh, that water eventually ends up. So I know we're going to be crossing a snow bridge, and that always makes me nervous, especially when there's a lot of water going underneath your feet. I know that at some point that bridge is going to collapse. Sometime in the spring it will collapse. And with a couple of people walking on it, that's not normal. It could be at that very moment. I mean, this is a risk you take. So we're going gingerly across the snow bridge. At this point, I'm getting nervous. I'm questioning our direction. I'm wondering where to go. And then it gets steeper and steeper. And we don't have crampons. We don't have ice axes. We're, we're just hiking. Rubber boots. And I look down and I visualize to myself what would happen if we slipped and fell. Like this picture of us just sliding down like 600 meters down into the rocks that are right along that icy lake below. And I think, Matt, you are such a stupid dad. What are you doing taking your son up here? Like you're already feeling this, but it's, it's my pride that keeps driving me forward. I think it's just up over that ridge because there are some tracks. This is where backcountry skiers go. You know, they do this. They risk their lives and they die doing it sometimes. But a responsible dad should not be doing this. And so I find myself at this impasse where I wonder, should I keep going or not? Is it wise to keep going or not? Am I going the right way or the wrong way? I was starting to question myself. And there are times in life where we hit those impasses. We wonder, how did we get here? Do I keep going forward or do I make a change? Do I turn around now or do I persevere? What are the implications if I keep going forward, not just upon myself, but upon those who are around me? Where's God in those moments where we've lost our way and we find ourselves uncertain about where we are? Maybe it's just been a few steps that we've taken dangerously off course. Well, today we're going to look at a beautiful story about a runaway slave. 
It's found in Genesis chapter 16. If you have your Bible, you should turn there. We're going to journey into the life of this runaway slave. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. It's a disturbing story, isn't it? Is this the handmaiden's tale or is this the Bible? (laughs) So there's several things happening in this story that are kind of shocking. First, a note. God had promised Abram and Sarai, that they would have children and descendants who would be a blessing to the whole world. And that had been 10 years prior to this moment. 10 years later, they're like, where's the kid? What's happening? Biological clocks are ticking, God. We don't see the answer. We've got an answer for you, God. Here's the plan. So in this story, you see surrogacy, polygamy, Human slavery, all these things wrapped into a few verses. Why is this happening? All these things are attempts of humans to get ahead and to control situations that are outside of their control. Also, the Bible is a progressive revelation of God's will to people. So in the book of Genesis, our understanding of God is very limited. The law had not yet been given. The Ten Commandments had not yet been spoken. Abram and Sarai have had very limited encounters with God. So they are operating under the moral framework of their culture. So what the Bible records in history isn't isn't always an endorsement of those behaviors, as would be true in this situation. This is just where these people are at, trying to figure things out, trying to manipulate things, trying to control things. And so here you have Abram and Sarai and the slave named Hagar. Where did she come from? You might ask that question. Well, when Abram had been pretending that his wife Sarai was his sister in Egypt with Pharaoh, Pharaoh had given Abram many gifts, including slaves. So many scholars believe that Hagar would have been one of those gifts who would have come from Pharaoh in Egypt while they were there during that time, which means that Hagar technically would be most likely an African as well. And so in this story, though, God is reaching out into the brokenness of humankind. He's meeting people where they're at in the midst of their messes, in the midst of their baggage. God had promised Abram and Sarai children. Their biological clocks are ticking. They're getting impatient. They decide to make things happen on their own, their own way, helping God out. So they're trying to achieve a legitimate desire, but they're doing it through an illegitimate means. And that's the nature of all of sin. Say, if if you look at what sin is, it's typically a legitimate desire that we're trying to have fulfilled through an illegitimate means. Have you ever thought about that? So I might desire God's provision. So what do you do? You might steal, right? Okay, so that's a legitimate desire, but an illegitimate means to achieve that. A person may desire intimacy and closeness to another human being. Legitimate desire fulfilled through an illegitimate means would be to, you know, have um, sexual immorality, something like that. Or a person has a legitimate desire to be heard, and they might be communicating in anger in a way that's hurtful to those around them. A legitimate desire trying to fulfill it through an illegitimate means. So you can pretty much analyze any sin and evaluate it through that lens. And I would just encourage you to trust God to meet your desires legitimately. (laughs) Don't, Don't take that temptation to take a shortcut. He knows what you need. Well, Abram agreed with what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, so again, it's 10 years of this waiting, Sarai, took his wife, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she knew that she was pregnant, she, Hagar, began to despise her mistress, Sarai. She was feeling arrogant. She was rubbing it in her face. And so Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave into your arms, and now that she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Abram's in the middle of this love triangle. It's it's scary. (laughs) Abram says, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she, Hagar, fled from Sarai mistreated her, 
abused her. We, we don't know the depth of the suffering that Hagar was subject to through Sarai, but we know it was enough to cause her to flee the situation. And then verse seven, the angel of the Lord, which the angel of the Lord appearing in the Old Testament, most scholars believe that's a theophany. It's an it's a appearance of God himself in visible or bodily form in the Old Testament. So the angel of the Lord shows up finds Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Where have you come from and where are you going? He asked her this question. So you think about this story. She is fleeing into the desert. She is a runaway slave. She's pregnant. She's vulnerable. She finds herself by a well because she needs water. Because when it says wilderness in the Old Testament or in the Bible, it's desert. And so it's really the only place she could have some sustenance. But she is in a dangerous place. What could happen to her if she stays there? What will happen to her if she continues on her journey? God knows what would happen to her if she continued in this course. She doesn't know where she's going. She only knows that she needs to run away, and she's at her breaking point. And the angel of the Lord meets her right there. He notices her. He reaches out to her, and he asks her this very important question. Where have you come from, and where are you going? Now, if God was to meet you right now and ask you that question, how would you answer it? Where have you come from, and where are you going? What's the trajectory of your life right now in this moment? The Lord calls her by name, and instead of giving her orders, he asks her that question. So pay attention to the trajectory of your life. Where are you headed right now? Especially if you're going through a crisis. If you're going through a crisis, I think it's even more important to be careful. Because in those moments, it's easy to get off course. It's easy to take a quick turn to make an irrational decision out of self-preservation. Well, there are times when we simply run away from circumstances, as Hagar was doing. Our instinct is fight or flight. And so people run away from churches, they run away from marriages, they run away from jobs, they run away from schools, they run away from recovery programs, they run away from commitments when things get overwhelming. Fear and panic can set in. And so if you're in a moment like that, just pay attention to where you're headed. Well, she answers then, the angel of the Lord, and she says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord says to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Man, God, did you really say this to her? This is bad advice. A woman in an abusive situation, you're telling her to go back? God, what are you thinking? Well, as I alluded to earlier, I believe that the prospects for Hagar are not good either direction. She is really stuck in a very difficult place. And the angel of the Lord knew better than you or I or her herself what would happen if she continued on that path. She would have died. She might have been raped. She could have been taken into a worse situation. She would not survive in the desert by herself. And so looking at these two really difficult situations, the angel of the Lord says you need to go back You need to stop running towards your death, stop running towards that danger, and return. And so this is important. There are those times when we need to stop, kind of like me when I was doing that hike. When headed down the wrong path, turn around and go back to the right path. Does this mean we always have to go back? No, but there are times. I'm asking if you are in that situation where you're not sure about what's ahead, to be prayerful. Seek the Lord. Pride often takes us further down the wrong path than we should go. Let go of that pride, turn around sooner rather than later. But I also want to encourage you that the right path is never perfect. So Hagar was going back, and that's not, it doesn't look good going back, but the path of God is never perfect in terms of our human experience. It's a narrow road. It's a difficult road. It includes trials. It includes losses. It includes pain. It includes difficulty and challenges. But we're committed to following Jesus together. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, come carry their cross, and follow him. So as part of that cross-carrying, that's difficult. 
But the alternative is way worse. Following Jesus is truly the best life. It is, there's peace, there's presence, there's fulfillment, there's purpose in that. And so, if you need to turn around, I just encourage you, you know, may we get back into the word of God. Go back onto a budget. Go back to having a family night. Go back into recovery. Go back to your boss. Go back to your parents. Go back to God if you need to do that. But do what the Lord tells you to do. And then in verse 10, the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. He gives Hagar this incredible promise that echoes the Abrahamic covenant. The promise that he gave to Abraham, this sounds a lot like it. He's now promising to Hagar that she's going to have descendants too numerous to count. And then the angel of the Lord also says to her, you are now pregnant. You will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. He will live in hostility towards all of his brothers. And so she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. He said, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I now have seen the one who sees me. This is really a beautiful moment. Hagar gives God a name. She calls him El Roy, the God who sees me. Hagar, this runaway slave, is the only one in the Old Testament who actually gives a name to God, the God who sees. And in directing Hagar back to Abram, God isn't directing her into a terrible situation. God is rescuing her. He's not abandoning her. He profoundly values her and the child that she is carrying. And so, when you see God noticing Hagar, it should be a great encouragement to all of us. God sees the runaway. God sees the slave. He sees the victim of abuse. Sometimes we just want to know that God sees and cares about what's going on in our lives. He gives us peace through his presence that something good can still happen in our lives. We need that assurance that we follow the God who sees us. I have nothing to fear if I know that God is watching over me. So God sees me, he values me, even when I feel trapped by undesirable circumstances. Not only does God see her, but he offers her these promises to increase her descendants. And you know, as as God's promising her about her son Ishmael, it says he will be a wild donkey of a man. He's going to be in conflict with his brothers. And you might look at that and say, oh man, that sounds pretty bad. That doesn't sound like a very complimentary thing, but the fact of the matter is is that she's saying, your son's not going to be a slave. He's going to be as free as a wild donkey. (laughs) He's going to be free. He's not going to be under that burden that you've been under. And yes, there will be conflict with his brothers, so there will be more children. This is a prophetic statement, really, that we see fulfilled even to this day, the descendants of Ishmael being some of the um, Arab tribes that that multiplied in that area, and the Israeli conflict, Isaac, who would be born later, you see that conflict, the fulfillment of this prophecy, even to this day. But to note that God is the one who sees you, he hears you, he pursues you, and he commits to you. He gives us promises as well. Well, we're going to fast forward now to Genesis 21. Now, Abram is called Abraham, Sarah is called, um, Sarai is called Sarah. And so there's no serious conflict recorded in scripture between Sarai and Hagar for the next 14 years. Abram, now known as Abraham, cares deeply for Ishmael. He thinks to himself, we did this right. We now have an heir. It's Ishmael. He's going to carry on the family line. It's all going to be great. But then a miracle takes place. Sarai or Sarah now gets pregnant with their own child. It's a miracle. And then Isaac is born, and this miracle complicates things greatly. This is really good news for Abraham and for Sarah, bad news for Hagar and Ishmael. Now they have a biological son. Now Ishmael, who was going to be the heir, is probably going to be displaced by their, this biologically born son of Abraham and Sarah. So let's see what happens in Genesis 21, verse 8. The child grew. This is the new child. Isaac, he was, and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. They're having a party for Isaac. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham was mocking. 
So Ishmael is mocking the young Isaac. And she said to Abraham, get rid of the slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. We need to get rid of them. We have no use for them anymore. We now have our own son. Abraham, just get rid of them. Cast them aside. Sarah blows up when 14-year-old Ishmael mocks her newly weaned Isaac. And so Abraham is torn between his love for Ishmael and his love for Sarah. This is a messy situation. The sins of the past are haunting Abraham. And verse 11 says, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son, I would say even his sons. But God said to him, do not be distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you to do because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. And early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water, and he gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered into the desert of Beersheba. So wavering about what to do, Abraham equips Hagar and Ishmael with some water and sends them out into the desert where they will struggle to survive. And if you think about how Hagar would have felt in this moment, she would have been heartbroken. She would have been devastated, in danger, losing everything. On her own, she finds herself again in a very dangerous situation. A single mom now, having been put out, having been replaced and displaced, forsaken by loved ones, wandering and wondering if anyone cared for her, including God. It's a similar situation to what she had experienced 14 years earlier. Well, verse 15, when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes, set him in the shade, and then she went off and she sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. I don't want to hear him crying. And she sat there and she began to sob herself. And God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and she filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. Okay, so in the midst of this profound despair, Profound disappointment when all hope seems lost. God sees Hagar and he keeps his promise. It was a long time in coming. You know, this late in life, but it's 14 years later in this act of redemption, God actually sets Hagar free. He rescues her. He hears her. He sees her. And she will never return to slavery again. I mean, letting go of the past for her was difficult, but in this moment, she finds her freedom. And ultimately, the story of Hagar is more than a story about her and her son. It's a story that God cares for those who have no hope. He cares for those who find themselves stuck in these dead ends of life. He cares for those who are powerless to help themselves. God cares for those who have lost hope. This is a story of God's love for the marginalized who may be amazed to discover that they're not alone, that God is whispering their name, that God is calling out to them, that God is meeting them right where they're at. When experiencing setbacks, there's hope knowing that the Lord walks this winding path of restoration for each and every one of us. I've often read this part of the Bible in, with kind of a, a bias. I've often read it and I thought, well, Sarah and Abraham and Isaac, they were, they were like the blessed ones and Hagar and Ishmael, you know, not so much. But I think that just re reflects maybe some latent bias or prejudice within my own heart. Because in this story, you just see God beautifully focusing on Hagar and Ishmael, rescuing them, redeeming them, reaching out to them. This is a story of God who values the undervalued. He sees us in the messiness of our life. 
He sees the victim of abuse. He sees the pregnant teenager who has nowhere to turn. He sees those who've been disowned by their families. He sees the men and women who are living on the street in our community or those who are living in their cars. He sees the lonely student who's being bullied. He sees the widow in the nursing home. He sees the refugee and the immigrant who's trying to make a life for themselves. And when we see them, we see as God sees. When we see them and love them, we love Jesus. As much as you do it for the least of these, Jesus would say, you've done it for me. And I want to challenge you and encourage you to see those who are around you. It's not easy to do. Man, I've, I've made that mistake. I've been so preoccupied and so busy, you know, and maybe I get a, I don't know how many emails a day, and I might not respond to that one or that two or that five. I don't know. You know, sometimes in the busyness of life, is anyone guilty of overlooking people around you? We get so preoccupied, it's hard to see those around us. But we have a God who sees the unseen, and I just want to encourage you and challenge you to try to be more self-aware. Lord, help me not just be self-aware, other self-aware. Help me to see those who are around me. Give me your heart and your eyes so that I can be your hands and your feet. This week, Heidi and I celebrate 33 years of marriage. Good job, Heidi. We've been happily married for like 30 years, you know, and so... Married for 33 years. I think this Thursday is our anniversary. She's in Orange County right now, uh, speaking at a church down there. They get to do three services, so I'm praying for Heidi. Go, Heidi. Lots of energy. You've got this. Um, but there have been times, even in our marriage, I just want to encourage you that, you know, it's easy to overlook those in your own household. You know, sometimes we will not see each other. Sometimes we will not hear each other. Just that preoccupation becomes so much that you can be in a marriage, you can be surrounded by family, you can be surrounded by children, and people feel alone, they feel unseen. There are times we have not heard each other, there are times when we have not seen each other. But this is something we're trying to get better at. The purpose of marriage is not to make us happy, it's to make us more like Jesus. And so, as we discover these lessons, then hopefully we grow to be more like him, because it is together that we can reflect the image of God. So do your best to be present with those around you, to value those who others might ignore. Our God is the God who sees us, he hears, protects, provides, directs, and restores. He's the God who sees, he cares, and he rescues. And Hagar was this woman who had experienced being seen by God in the midst of all her hurt and all, all of her brokenness, her bitterness, the unfairness of life, and even her own sins and mistakes. But this changed her life, and she left this moment knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that God saw her and loved her. Is there anyone here who feels out of God's sight or overlooked by God today? God wants you to hear that he is the God who sees you. He is with you. Yes, maybe it seems like it's been 10 years and those prayers haven't been answered, but he is still there. And if we stay bitter, we'll never see the well. There was a well right by Hagar when God met her that second time and she couldn't see it. You know, when I was hiking with my son up that slope away from Snow Lake, so I found out later, and I, I finally just stopped. And he's like, Dad, didn't you say that if it feels like you're going the wrong way, you probably are? And I go, oh yeah, somebody did say that, didn't they? And so as I look back at him, I look over my shoulder and I see this other ridge behind me, and there's like this zigzag going up that ridge. And I see, oh, hey, look, that looks like the trail. We, we left it behind back there. All right, we need to go back, and we need to get back on track, back on that trail. I said, three points of contact at all times. Okay, this is steep, this is slippery. We're gonna walk down like this, right? Because, you know, the more points of contact, the less likely you are to slip. And so I, I felt stupid, I felt like a bad dad, but. We got out of there alive. God's grace is there for us. And so you, maybe you feel trapped by circumstances. You know, we, we get ourselves even just a little bit off track. Or maybe we grow impatient waiting on, on the promises of God. Or maybe your life is just routine. You know, life isn't just one big crisis for most of us. Sometimes life is really mundane. And you find yourself wondering, what is my purpose? 
eight hours a day, nine hours a day, 10 hours a day, five days a week, doing the same thing. Does God see me? Does God care about the routine? Am I just punching my, the clock day after day? And I just wanna encourage you that God says, I see you, I hear you, I'm there for you, I have a purpose for you. My promises are, are there for you and there is a plan and a purpose that God has even in the routine. And in the routine, I think we also need to pay attention to the direction of our life. So you do matter. God, we all matter to God. And so I encourage you today to receive that from him, but also to ask God to give you that heart to be able to see those who are around you. Let's pray and respond to God's word. Lord, I thank you for the story of Hagar. She was a foreigner, she was a slave. And yet, you reached out to her. This has always been your way. You've always looked out for those who are on the fringe. You've always looked out for those who are overlooked. You've always looked out for those who are powerless. And Lord, I ask, ask for anyone who feels that way right now today, I pray you would reveal yourself to them. That you are the God who sees. You are the God who cares. You are the God who rescues. You are the God who meets them where they are at. And Lord, I ask for all of us that you would give us eyes like yours to not overlook people but to be the presence of God in our world that would see those who others don't see, that we would bring your love into those situations. Lord, we confess our own busyness. We confess our own preoccupation. We confess our own selfishness that causes us to just do our own thing. But Lord, give us your heart. Give us your eyes. Give us your ears to see and to act and to do the things you've called us to do to bring the love of Christ to our world. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen, amen. I wanna encourage you today um, that if you are in a place where spiritually you're like, you know what, I felt overlooked by God, but I am hearing God today. He is calling to me, he's calling me to himself. And you, you need to begin a relationship with Jesus or you're beginning a relationship with God or you're returning to God. There's a couple things you could do as we conclude our time together. One, you could come up after service and pray for a member of our, with a member of our prayer team. Prayer is powerful, and it's good to share that experience with somebody else. Secondly, there's Next Steps cards in the seats in front of you, and if you are beginning a relationship with Jesus, grab a card, go to the Next Steps counter, drop it off with your name on it, and they will give you some resources that will help you get started in a relationship with God, and then we'll see you in the next baptism tank, next time we do a baptism, okay? Because that'll be the next step after that. Um, Next week, on Sunday, it's Father's Day, and so we're going to be celebrating our Heavenly Father here at New Life Church. We're all sons and daughters of God, so come, bring a friend, and uh, we'll have a great time together doing that. So let's go with the God who sees us, and let's be those who see those who are around us. Have a great week. Thank you.